Praise the Lord. Go go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 8. I can't get off of this uh, teaching on authority right now. uh, We're going to do a little refreshing. We started this off with the centurion. Because Jesus said of all the people he had met during his time on earth so far at that point. He said, I've not met any, anybody else with faith like this guy. This guy has the greatest faith of anybody that I have met, even in Israel. And you've got to remember, the Roman was a, I mean, the centurion was a Roman fellow. He wasn't a Jew. At that moment, he really had no covenant with God. Now, he was an anti-Jew. They, you can read other accounts there. It says he, he had contributed toward the building of synagogues and had helped God's people. He, he was serving God all that he could. But it's amazing to me that Jesus said, of all the people I have encountered, this man, he has the greatest faith of anybody I've seen. Well, see, I don't want to be known for my little faith. Do you? (laughs) I don't want to be, oh, that Gary, he has such a little faith. That's not how I want to be known. (laughs) I want to be known as a person of great faith, and I know you do too. So if Jesus says, this fellow, he has the greatest faith, let's... We started here so we can learn some things about why did he have more faith than anybody else. So we'll pick it up here in Matthew 8, starting in verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Now that's important. No no words are in the Bible by accident or are extraneous this is this is not a head cold this guy's not home with a little mild fever grievously tormented is grievously this is a difficult situation don't ever think your situation's too hard for the Lord by the way I don't care what it looks like okay well Jesus just said unto him I will come and heal him and the centurion answered and said Lord I'm not worthy that thou should come under my roof and we've talked about that he wasn't being all humble and unworthy like the messages I heard growing up. He just meant he's a Gentile. And at that moment before the cross, the law was still in effect, of course, and it was illegal, really unlawful, for a Jew to go underneath the roof of a, of a Gentile. So he's really being very courteous to the Lord. He doesn't want to cause him any trouble, you know. No, you don't need to come under my roof. I'm a Gentile. But notice this. Now here he starts declaring his faith. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Boy, there it is. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Then he gives us some insight as to what gives him such great faith. It's because he understands authority. He says, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. So when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Come on down to verse 13. Jesus said unto the centurion now. He says, go thy way. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Let me give you a little review from some of our notes here. Why did the centurion have such great faith? He understood what authority is. That word authority that we're using all the time, the Greek word is exousia. We've given you the definition for that. It literally means authority, jurisdiction, liberty, power, right, and strength. But I really like vines. Vines' definition of that word, you know, vines' expository dictionary of New Testament words is the whole title. His definition that he gives for it, authority, that is the right to exercise power. (laughs) 
Why did those men obey the centurion? You know, we kind of picture, you know, you see all these movies of a Roman centurion. You think of some big dude, you know, and got on all the trappings. What if he was a Wally Cox 90-pound weakling? You know, what if, his, what if he had little skinny arms and he was just a little dude, you know? They didn't obey him because he himself was such a big bad dude. Rome was a big bad dude. <laughs> Why did he have authority? Because he was a man under authority. He had yielded to Rome. His whole life was in Rome's hands. He did not even get to choose what city he lived in. He didn't get to choose what his assignment was. He didn't get to choose his position in the army. It is very much like being submitted to Christ. You don't get to choose if you're an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, or a, a, a administration helps. You don't get to choose that. He chooses that. I don't get to choose whether I'm a pastor or an apostle. I already know. He told me what I am. I'm a teacher. None of us know what Dave is. <laughs> you can't put Dave in a box. I don't know what I see all of them in him, you know. I see all of them in him at various times. Praise God. But the point is, you're submitted. So we made this statement. You will never be a person of authority to become a person under authority. The seven sons of Sceva found that out real well. Remember they saw miracles happen from Paul? I mean, it got the, the thing that happens right before the, the story about the seven sons, they took the handkerchiefs from Paul, you know, Paul's body... All he did was take the handkerchiefs and lay them on people that had devils. Now, what kind of people is that? Well, it could have been bipolar, schizophrenic, could have been suicidal people. You know, they had devils. And all you do, you take a hanky <laughs> and you lay it on the person. Ow! And the devil goes and the guy gets up and says, what's been going on? <laughs> Why am I here? He, he's been under the influence of that devil for all these years. You lay a hanky on the guy. In the name, now in the name of Jesus. And he's healed. The seven sons of Sceva, they see that and they make a living pretending to cast out devils. They sell, I always nearly say lucky charms, but it was, they weren't invented yet. That was <laughs> the cereal. They sell magic. <laughs> they, they would sell magic charms and they had incantations. It was witchcraft, actually. But they would... You know, and that's why they, they were vagabond Jews. They, they moved from town to town. Why? Because if they stick around very long, people will figure it out. This ain't working. So they'd come, get your money, sell your stuff, sell the stuff, and then they'd move on to the next town. Well, they saw that power come out of Paul in the name of Jesus. So they go, hey, we're going to add this to our, our bag of tricks. You know? So they go up and they go to some devil-possessed person, and they go, we adjure thee, which means that we command you. In the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. <laughs> they weren't under authority. They weren't submitted to the king. They didn't have any relationship with Christ. That devil says, Paul I know. No, it says, Jesus I know. Paul I know. Who are you? <laughs> that, that demon, seven of those guys, one demon... That, that demon-possessed fella jumped on them, beat them up, and sent them out running off naked. And that wasn't done in a private place. Everybody saw it. And the whole town, there was a revival in Ephesus. People came and burned. When they saw the magicians get run off, they went, whoa. But they see the power in the name that Paul, when Paul does it, they see power. They go, we're burning these witchcraft books. And they, they, weren't, they wouldn't even sell them. Like, they would, didn't go to the used bookstore. <laughs> to sell these books, that the fear of God so fell. They said, we're burning these. And it says they confessed their sins. Well, in context, they were confessing. They're practicing the, the black magic and the arts, the dark arts, they call them, and that kind of thing. Okay. So, in the most simplest terms, this centurion, he understood authority. And Jesus equated that with faith. Did you see that? Now watch, in the most simple term, here's what the man understood. Rome is backing up everything I, I do. And I don't do anything 
apart from Rome's instructions. You get this? He's not out doing anything on his own. He's not building his own little kingdom somewhere. He is in the service of Rome. Because of that, because he is submitted to... Does this remind you of a verse, Seek ye first the kingdom of God? But anyway, he's, <laughs> he says, <clears throat> When I give a command, when I speak, it is done. My men don't argue with me. They don't try and talk me out of it. There's no negotiation. Because of the authority I have from Rome, when I speak to those that I have authority over, when I speak, it is done. Now somehow, I don't know how, he knew that God Almighty had given Jesus authority over all sickness and disease. I don't know how much he understood, but I know he understood that part. Because <clears throat> he equated it. He says, so <clears throat> because he understood he was a man under authority, he understood Jesus was a man, if you'll allow me, under authority, totally submitted to God. Isn't that what Jesus had said? I don't do anything but what I see my father do it. I don't say anything but what I hear my father say it. How much of that the centurion had heard, I don't know. But he knew Jesus was a man under authority. <clears throat> Therefore, he knew that Jesus had the same authority over sickness that the centurion had over his men. He says, I know that if you just speak the word only, my servant shall be healed. Now get this. There will be no negotiation. There's not a, not a maybe so. Jesus, when you speak, it is done. Now, in our lessons, we've gone on. This is not the lesson for today, a review. In our lessons, we've gone on to show that when Jesus, his last statements to his disciples, both in Mark and in Matthew, he says, all authority has been given unto all, all exousia has been given unto me both in heaven and in earth. Therefore, you go. And in the one, he says, go to uh, all the nations and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. But in Mark's account, he says, I want you to go and teach them. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. Only the apostles, right? Is that what he said? Them that believe, they will cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. They shall recover. It's that same authority that he has delegated us. See, that centurion today would have a really hard time tracking down Jesus himself to get Jesus to speak the word only. Because Jesus, in his glorified body, the only body where he himself has lips, he is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. He has a new body. He is seated there. That's the only body he has, and it's in heaven. The only lips Jesus has on planet earth are on your face. <laughs> we are the only lips that he has. And if he is going to speak the word only on planet earth, he has to do it through us or it does not get spoken. Amen. Isn't that something? We've not understood the authority we have. Now, I'm not going to... I started to say how many are submitted to him, but I don't want to get everybody lying in church. So, because <laughs> we're all partially. To be honest with you, we're all some degree of submitted to him. He has more I am uh, let me understand. he has more dominion over my flesh now. I'm talking in my walk, not in my position. Than he did ten years ago. I'll tell you right now. Look at me, I'm getting skinnier all the time. Look at me. He's working on me. <laughs> <It's Mike. laughs> Amen. He has more dominion over my thought life. He does. 
He has more uh, dominion over my goals in life. My goals, anyway, trust me. We're all in some various stages of submission. Okay? Now, the devil will tell you you've got to be 100% submitted. And if that's the case, you know why he wants you to believe that? Because you'll never believe you have authority. No. You're already in that place. We're going to see that. You're going to see that real clear before today's lesson is over. Today's lesson, the title, I can just tell you right now. It's the authority of believing. There is an authority that comes with believing that doesn't come any other way. Now, I'm looking forward to hear Alan teach about the authority of love, which he, he hung it out and teased us with it this morning. And I'm going to really come down hard on him if later <laughs> you'll think the hammer of God come on him now. I'll tell you, I want to hear all about that. I wrote that down, the authority of love. I heard that. You think I didn't hear that? I heard that. And I know partly what he's talking about, but I can tell he's got some. I'm looking forward to that being served up on the buffet line. You're going to want to elbow you right out of the way. Get right up in front. I want, in love, though. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, elbow you out in love, you know. <laughs> Let's practice a moment. We're the only body of Christ. He doesn't have any body on this earth except ours. We have got to start getting the revelation of that. So say this with me. I am, his disciple. I am his disciple. Jesus is my king. Jesus is my, king. My, king my king has given me authority to speak on his behalf, on, his behalf. on behalf of his kingdom, on, of his kingdom. on, planet, Earth. on planet Earth. Because I am under authority, I am under authority. He, has he has given me authority. And I understand it the same way the centurion did. When I, when I speak in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus it, is done. it is done. Whenever I speak to the mountain, I to the mountain and I command it to be cast into the sea, I don't doubt in my heart. But I believe that what I say, what I say shall, come to pass. shall come to pass. When I speak, when I speak it is done. And I have whatsoever I say. I am a wrecking ball for the kingdom of darkness. I destroy the works of hell everywhere I go. I've been sent on the same assignment as Jesus himself. I have been anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power. To go about in the name of Jesus, doing good, healing all that are oppressed of the devil. For God the Holy Ghost is with me. I have received power, not just authority, but dunamis power, because the Holy Ghost has come on me. He's not only on me. He's not only with me, he's in me. I have the light of life. When I walk in the room, darkness flees. I have the light of life. When I walk in the room, in the name of Jesus, devils tremble. For they know their time has come. We're going to get this. We're going to get this. This is called revival. This is called revival. See? This is revival. It's his word. It's a, we're not saying anything except what he said. This is what he said. But see, the authority comes when you believe it. Now, that brings us to today's lesson. <laughs> the authority of believing. Now, let's, you're still in Matthew 8, right? I want you to look real careful. Now, what the... What, what the centurion asked for was speak the word only and my servant will be healed. So I would expect somewhere in Jesus' response for him to say, thy servant is healed. To me, that would be 
speak the word only, right? Or he might quote like he did with the devil. It is written, the Lord is the Lord that healeth thee. You know, Jehovah Rapha, right? The Lord that healeth thee. But he doesn't precisely say that. Now look at this. Ver look at verse 13. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way. Now if you underline. And as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. It's a little bit oblique. It's a little bit sideways. It's not quite expressly, thy servant is healed. And I've been praying about that. I'm going, to, why did you say it that way? As thou hast believed. Now, we, you could just take the most simple thing like, well, this is what he believed for, so this is what he got. Okay, I'm not going to argue that. But watch this. <laughs> As you have believed, be it done. First thing you got to do, notice there where it says, As thou hast believed. Let me make sure I before I say it. So be it done unto thee. See that word so is in italics? Draw a line through that. Draw a line through that. Because what Jesus said was this. As thou hast believed, be it done. As thou hast believed, be it done unto thee. And in this case, the centurion, as thou hast believed for someone other than yourself. Isn't this something? Hello, intercessors. As thou hast believed for someone else. I'm going to say it again. It is conspicuously absent any information at all about the servant who was homesick. We don't know if he was a nice guy, not so nice guy, a really good servant, a not so good servant. We don't know anything about him, and I think that's by God's design because it's not based on him. It's based on what can you believe, and it's based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. I think it's conspicuously absent on purpose. Intercessors, you can get help for people. Amen. Intercessors, we have more power than we've ever thought we had power for. When I say intercessors, you're not going to find a calling of intercessors. But I have found people that are really attuned to that type of prayer. But see, I know, you know what this tells me though? I know that centurion wasn't no intercessor. <laughs> He's a soldier in the army. And if that old dude can get it, I can get it for somebody else. If that guy can get it, I can get it. How many people had he put to death in the name of Rome? Jesus still, he got what he believed. Mm. Jesus never said these words. Not in this story. Not in this passage. He never said, thy servant is healed. What he did say was, as thou hast believed, be it done. Jesus could have said it this way. Now I'm paraphrasing. This is Gary's paraphrase. Don't write me no letters. As the king of the kingdom, I decree that as you have believed, be it done unto thee. If you approach the king and you ask for something at his throne and you present your case, then when the king speaks, that kind of settles the issue, doesn't it? This is really what the king decreed. As you have believed, be it done. In other words, Jesus still put the responsibility of believing on us. We don't have it because we say it while still doubting in our heart. Conversely, we don't have it because we believe it in our heart but never say it. Faith always has two parts. Believing with the heart and saying with the mouth. Go to Romans 10. I know you know this, but 
It's a good time to have a refresher. When you believe in the heart, I'm telling you right now, the king of our kingdom, when we believe in our heart and say with our mouth, our king will always say, be it done. Did you get that? You're looking at your Bible. Look up here at me. <laughs> well, I told you to turn there, didn't I? Okay. All right. I'm sorry. My fault. If you approach the king, if, the, if somehow you could approach the king and you present your case and he looks on your heart and he says, well, they believe it. Like he looked on that centurion. And then they say it. The king in heaven, he decrees, be it done. And I'm telling you right now, all the resources of heaven backs that up. There's no negotiation. There's no talking him out of it. There's no maybe so. The king has decreed, as you have believed, be it done. Now, did you find Romans 10? <laughs> I'm sorry. I kind of interrupted you. Okay. Believing has two parts. It always has two parts. What saith it? Starting in verse 8, Romans 10, 8. The word is nigh thee. Well, where is it nigh thee? On thy coffee table at thy house. No? On thy iPhone in thy pocket. No? That's all good. It's fine to have. A, but eventually, sooner or later, the word, and I find it so interesting that it's in the mouth first in this. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Now we always right there equate it with the new birth. And that's fine. That's the starting point. But what if you're already born again? Is that the last time you got to approach your king? The Greek word there is sozo. And it means salvation for whatever you need. You got a blind man, if you believe in your heart and say with the mouth, you don't have to stay blind. Poor man, sick man, leprosy man, on and on and on we go. You got to get God's word in your heart and in your mouth. And when you do that, the king will say, every time, it is done. Or what if I said, be it unto you as you have believed? Is that good stuff or what? Now, we're going to look at the difference between believing and not believing. Go ahead and go to Luke 9. Put, in fact, put a marker in Luke 9 and Mark 9. We're going to look at the same account in two places. Hallelujah. If there's any type and shadow of the believer's anointing, this fellow we're about to look at is him. Just how did Dave used to say that? Joe Public, Mary Wallpaper. This is, this is to me, the perfect precursor to Mark 16. Those that believe in my name, they'll do all this work. Now watch this. Luke 9, let's pick it up in verses 49 here. Luke, Luke 9, 49. And John answered and said, Master... I hear pages turning, sorry. It's a long chapter, I know. John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils. Now notice it doesn't say a trying to cast out devils. Like the seven sons of Sceva. No, it says we saw one casting out devils. This was happening. In thy name, I notice. We saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him... Because he followed not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not. For he that is not against us is for us. Now look in Mark's account. Mark 9. Starting 
starting in verse 38. John answered him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him because he follows not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which... Now notice how he words it here. There is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. Now in the one place it's called casting out devils, but here it's called doing a miracle. Now the thing about this, are you in Luke? I don't know which one you're in. Go back to Luke, I'm sorry, Luke 9. I want to, I want to look at the verses leading up to this. This makes so much more sense when you look at it in context. How many appreciate Pastor Dave? teaching us all those years ago about meditating everything in context. Luke 9, picking it up in verse 46. Then there rose a reasoning among them. This is the twelve. Which of them should be the greatest? See what's on their mind? Which one of us is going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, he took a child. And if you look that up in the Greek, it's a little child. He took a little child and set him by him and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. Now, that phrase, the very next thing then is where Jesus says this. You know, where, see, that phrase, the least among you, that reminded John of that no-name guy <laughs> that they saw casting out devils. He said, the least among you. I mean, they're, they're wanting to know, well, which one of us is the greatest? And Jesus takes a little child. He says, no, the one that's great among you, he, he's going to be the least. And something in John, it triggered his memory. He's thinking... Well, that's like that no-name guy we passed the other day. I mean, he hasn't been coming to the meetings. He's not one of the... Jesus never called him. He's not one of the twelve. But, you know, he, that guy... He was getting her done in today. <laughs> he was casting out devils, not just trying to cast them out. So it, it, made Jesus, it made John remember that guy. And so he brought it up. And Jesus says, no, 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 don't, don't stop him. If he's not against us, he's for us. Now, I've thought a lot about I've meditated on this guy a lot. I've searched. I've read commentaries. I've done everything that I know to do. Nobody even knows this guy's name. This guy that they saw, this no-name guy, for all eternity. We don't know his name. Now, that ought to be encouraging to you. <laughs> they may never know your name either. Is that going to stop you from casting out devils and doing miracles in his name? Absolutely not. I've studied it out. As far as we can tell, we don't ever see that Jesus called him into the ministry. As far as we know, he's not one of the twelve, not one of the seventy. He is Joe Public, Mary Wallpaper. But you know what made him different? He believed in that name. He believed in that name. That's what Peter said. It said, why look ye on us as if by our own power or holiness? No, no. It is that name through faith in that name. This guy believed in the name. He believed that he, when he used the name of Jesus, heaven would back him up. Now get this. I'm, this I think this is coming later, but I can't, I'm going to do it now. You can't cast out devils without the Holy Ghost working with you. Now you've got to get that. That is important. You can't cast out devils without the Holy Ghost. Jesus himself said, I cast out devils with the finger of God. Another place, I do it by the Spirit of God. You, that means the Holy Ghost was working with Mr. No Name. I was listening to an evangelist here just yesterday. And he's been, uh, he's got a real healing. And you know evangelists, you know how, how did Alan say it? You know, they always make you feel really guilty. 
Because, you know, they can't see outside their evangelist calling. Only, only page you need in your Bible is John 3.16. Rip it out because we got people dying right down here on Brookside. We got to go, you know, pass out tracts and whatever. He said, if you're not doing that, they make you feel guilty, right, Alan? Well, there's other callings. <laughs> but I was listening to this guy's testimony. I love this guy. I mean, I love. And sure enough, miracles accompanies him everywhere he goes. Now, the thing of it is, he's training up his four-year-old daughter to do the same. Four years old. And says, my daughter is a praying machine. <laughs> he tells about they were standing in line at, at some amusement park with a long line. And way up, in, I mean, people are, you know, they got you in those barricades. You know, you're lined up single file, right? And maybe for two hours. He says, my little four-year-old daughter, she saw a lady in a wheelchair way up there. And she just tugged on my, he said, tugged on my shirt. said, daddy, Jesus wants to heal her. He said, well, do what, you, do what you think. Well, he couldn't get up there, but that little four-year-old girl, she just wiped through the legs and then she, just, she just went right up through there. For long, he's watching her. He says he was thinking about that, watching his four-year-old daughter go up there. And he's thinking now, the same Holy Ghost that works with him works with his four-year-old daughter. And more than that, that's the same Holy Ghost that worked with Jesus of Nazareth. And that's the same Holy Ghost that worked with Mr. No Name. You got, say it with me, I got the same Holy Ghost. I got the same Holy Ghost on me that Jesus had on him. Same power, same anointing, same Holy, Same Holy Ghost. I like, I like that. that. That made me think for a minute. I said, whoa. Now we're all growing in Christ. Holy Ghost is not growing. <laughs> you got the full grown, fully powerful, can I say one and only, <laughs> Holy Ghost. The same one that anointed Jesus of Nazareth. We're supposed to be a wrecking ball. For the kingdom of darkness. Instead of Christians going around. Oh what's the devil going to do. When we wake up in the morning. Devils should tremble. What are these Christians going to do today. Destroying my works. How many works are there. It took me a lifetime to build the strongholds in that guy. And this Christian is going to come by. And just use the name. And cast. cast just bring all those strongholds down. In the world. Just cast those devils out. Same Holy Ghost. He's not growing. You, you're packing, honey. <laughs> You've been filled with the Holy Ghost. You're packing. You got God everywhere you go, God goes. That's Acts 10, 38. For God was with him and God is with you. That's why Jesus said, Father, as thou hast sent me, I'm sending them. Well, God didn't send him to do the work without the Holy Ghost, and guess what? Jesus said, don't even leave town. Don't even think about going out to represent the kingdom till you've been baptized with the same power I was baptized with. My leg's about to run off here. Glory to God. All right, some notes about... I love this. I love this. That is a lion clock, by the way. Let's talk about Mr. No Name a little more. As far as we, we don't know his name. We never see Jesus calling him into the ministry. He's not part of the fivefold for sure. I want to tell you again that nobody can cast out devils or do miracles in the name of Jesus without the co-laboring of the Holy Spirit. But you notice that same Holy Spirit did not co-labor with the seven sons of Sceva. They had no authority because they were not under authority tells me something about this guy's heart. If the Holy Ghost is co-laboring with him, now, he wasn't born again yet, Evie. He's not even born again. But I know this guy is yielding his heart to the King of Kings with all that he knows how. Otherwise, he wouldn't have authority. Verse 6. What authorized the Holy Spirit to co-labor with him and not the seven sons of Sceva? The difference is it's the authority of believing. 
he believed in Jesus Christ that he was who he says he that he is who he says he is now let's contrast this man normally on this story we go to Matthew 17 and we're about to look at the man that brought his lunatic son but I want you to this today let's go to Mark's version Mark 9 Mark 9. Because we're going to contrast this no-name guy and his believing with the man who brought his lunatic son and his believing. Okay? Okay, now we'll just read the story here. Verse, we may have to go to both of them to get all the flavor here. Did, most of you know Matthew 17 version by heart because Dave lovingly read it to us every quarter for 22 years or 25. <laughs> what was the cure for their own? When they said, why could not we cast it out? What was the reason? Because of your unbelief. And what was the cure? This kind, this kind of devil? No, this kind of unbelief comes not out but by prayer and fasting. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, with that understanding, that's why the disciples couldn't cast it out. But now, let's look at the Father. There's a little verse here that has scratched my belly. If you have itched me. Every time I'd go past it, I would know there's something there that I wasn't quite getting for 30 years. I mean, I've been at this a long time. And I just recently got it. I finally understand. Anyway, you'll like it when we get there. So let's pick up this story in Mark 9, uh, verse... 14. And when he, that's Jesus, came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, now this is what the Spirit does, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnashes with his teeth and pineth away. Pineth away means the guy's not eating. He's getting skinny, like he looks like skin on bones, you know. He's pining away. This is serious. He's foaming at the mouth, gnashing with his teeth, getting real bony looking skeleton. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered them and said, Atta boy, y'all really tried hard. No. I believe unbelief shocks Jesus. I believe we're going to come to the place where it will us too. I think it's more natural for us to believe as believers than it is to not believe. It shocks him. Oh, faithless generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? You bring him here to me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. Why do you think that spirit did that? He's trying to have the same effect on Jesus that he had on the disciples. He got the disciples to be moved by what they saw. And he's trying the same tactic with Jesus. Jesus asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. Oft times it's cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. Boy... <laughs> This next sentence here. The father. Now remember he brought him to the disciples. And the, the disciples couldn't. They couldn't get it done. Now he looks to Jesus. But if you can do anything. <laughs> if you can do anything. Have compassion on us. And help us. Now here's the part that always itched me. This next thing that Jesus said then to him. Jesus said unto him. If thou. Thou. Can't believe. Now he doesn't 
talk about the disciples here that didn't get it done. This is the part that itched me. Because he's talking directly to that father. And that, can we all agree this is a bad case? Can we all agree? Can you imagine this from a child up into whatever age this boy is now? This father has lived with these circumstances. And we're not belittling that. That's tough. Tough. I, I have heroes that, have, that deal with cerebral palsy children and others that are born with deformities. They're heroes of mine. Amen? The compassion that they have and the love that they have no matter what. But people, we're going to walk above human compassion. We're going to walk above human love. God has a love that restores and heals. That's where we're going to go. That's where we're going. Because this poor fellow, and I, I feel for this guy. He comes and he brought him to the 12. It'd be like bringing him to church today. It'd be like bringing him to the church. We've, had, we've already seen it several times, you know. Thank God for every miracle we have seen. I'm talking about the ones where they died. They could go, well, we brought them to your disciples, the church. They couldn't do anything if you can do anything. And normally, Jesus already kind of chewed out the 12 earlier there. <laughs> but notice he doesn't talk about them now. When that, when that father asks him that, he goes right back to the father. He says, if you can do anything, help us. And notice how, I want to say it again, now watch. And Jesus said unto him, the Father, if thou, let me, looking right into that Father's eyes, if you can believe, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. We just got through reading about a man with no name, no reputation, not called into the fivefold. Yet this man had faith. He believed. And when he cast out devils, they left. What is the difference between Mr. No Name and the father of this child? Doesn't he have the same right? Doesn't he have the same name? Access to the name of Jesus, don't they both? I've meditated and meditated, and this is why Jesus says it to this, this fellow. He's saying, look, if you can believe, you can command that devil out. And it'll go because it's my name that makes it go. Now that's hard on us. That's hard on Gary. I have prayed for them myself. I've laid hands on them till about rubbed their hair off. And they've died. But that doesn't give Gary the right to change the truth. Or to, rate, or to start proclaiming doctrine based on my experience. Jesus is looking at that father. But in my mind he's looking right straight into my eyes. Like I'm looking into yours. Jesus is saying, if you can believe, all things are possible. Now, why are they possible? Because all of heaven's resources will back up what you believe in your heart and say with your mouth. Did you get that? I never understood why he would do that. And it wasn't until I started seeing... Mr. No Name compared with Mr. Father of the Lunatic Boy. They both had access to the same name. They both had access. One believed and one didn't believe. The Holy Ghost worked with the one. Is the Holy Ghost everywhere? Was the Holy Ghost power available to deliver that lunatic boy when he was a little child? Why, why didn't it happen? No believer. No believer present. Nobody who believed in the heart and said with the mouth. Because that same Holy Ghost, he'll never say no. When there's faith in the heart, when, there's, when you believe in the heart and say with the mouth, it is done. That's what the king decreed. You remember? 
as thou hast believed. What did the king decree? As thou hast believed, be it done unto thee. That is the mandate of our king. That is the law of the kingdom. That will never change. Now thank God that this father had enough sense to recognize where he was. After Jesus said, what I'm saying is he located his own faith right after that. Look what he says. Hmm. Yes, verse 24. Let read verse 23 again for context. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Now, he's locating where he is. He's going, Lord, if I didn't believe at all, I would not be here. I would not have brought my son to your disciples or to you. But Lord, that's where my belief ends. I, I hear what you're saying. But that's what I'm going. I do believe, but it's in a measure. Lord, help thou my unbelief. And did you know he did? Jesus will meet you right where you are. I'm reminded again of that day that they diagnosed me the first time with melanoma cancer. It was about 1990. I was in my early 40s. And uh, we, Sue and I had to, she had noticed this mole on my chest that I'd had forever, but it started getting larger and a little angry reddish brown. She says, you're going to have that looked at. And I said, yes, ma'am. Smart husband. And, uh, I really didn't think that. I just thought I was, you know, I was in my 40s. I just thought I didn't think it'd be anything, to be honest with you. When I saw that doctor walking down the hall with the test results, I already knew by the countenance on his face this was not going to be a good report. And he says, sir, I hate to tell you this, but you have it's some name, but melanoma cancer. It is the most deadly, fastest spreading kind. We're going to send you to MD Anderson Hospital in Houston for the best care, but young man, I'll never forget these words. Young man, if I was you, I'd get my affairs in order. I don't think you have six months. We were not expecting that. We we're in our early 40s. Man, the, the ride in the car on the way home, we couldn't even talk. We were so hurt, so stunned. Thank God, my wife. She asked me the very best question she could have asked. She reached over in that car, put her hand on my shoulder and said, What can you believe? Intellectually, I'd been at this a while. Y'all don't know this. We were first ordained a long time ago. Preached in prisons, did a lot of things, you know. I'm glad there's not many tapes of those services, by the way. Oh, that was before that was that was BD that's before Dave <laughs> there's BD and AD after Dave you know. but anyway see intellectually I already knew that, that God can heal and, and that it was possible for a person to just believe and, and not have any medication or any surgery just believe I knew that was possible but she asked me the right question she didn't ask me what was possible she asked me what can you believe and where we were at that moment, we had, I had not been walking as close with the Lord as I should have been for a while, and there's a reason for that. But anyway, I, I ran, I just did an internal search, if you'll allow me. And these two things came up out of my mouth. I said, I can believe two things. Number one, that the diagnosis does not have to be as bad as what that man just said. And that number two, no matter what the happens, no matter what, what they do, they're going to get every cell of that cancer out of my body. She says, I agree with you in Jesus' name. Condensing a lot. You have to go see other specialists, the actual surgeon and so forth. It's actually going. The very next time we got a report from a different doctor, now listen to this. That doctor, he came down the hall with a different look on his face. And he said, now, Mr. Carpenter. Oh, yeah. First thing he said was, I don't want to get your hopes up. <laughs> we're, 
we're both thinking, oh, for the love of God, give us some hope, you know. <laughs> we need our hope up. The other guy didn't give us any hope at all. Six months, that's it, you know. I don't want to get your hopes up. But this just might be what we call a surface spreading melanoma. I said, well, what is that? He said, well, it spreads faster on the surface of the skin than it does it penetration. It, it may not really be in your bloodstream yet. And if that's the case, with some simple surgery, it might be possible to get every cell of that cancer out of your body. It was exactly the two things we had agreed on. The diagnosis was different, and even the doctor saying now, we might be able to get all every cell of that cancer out of your body. Sue and I, did, we looked at each other, did a high five, and we said, that is what it is then. A few weeks go by, by the t it kept getting milder and milder. Every time they'd see us or talk, by the time they actually did that surgery, they did it on a, I didn't even have to spend one night in the hospital. It was almost done on an outpatient basis, you know. I can, how, and can you tell that was, I'm not in my early 40s anymore. <laughs> That's been a long six months. The authority of believing. Jesus met us right where we were. If my believing at that time would have been, I speak the word only and I'm healed. And if I was really there in my heart, he would have met me there. And I would not even have had the surgery. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And he will. He'll meet you right where you are. Amen? But we don't want to stay where we are. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Okay, we're going to keep growing. I'm really starting to run over it, but let me, let me give you just a few more things. Y'all getting anything out of this? The authority of believing. The authority of believing. So I wrote these notes here. This father at this point was not even sure that Jesus himself could do anything. Much less did he believe that he could cast out the devil in the name of Jesus. Obviously, he didn't believe that. When he says, I believe, he means he believes enough to bring his son to Jesus. Well, thank God for that. It's good to know where your level of believing is. So the question is, what can you believe? Where are you right now? See, a lot of people are walking in more, they really have more belief than they know they have. Part of the reason he's having me teach along this line. The, I just saw it. It's so clear. Y'all know how an eagle gets the eaglets to fly when it's time to fly? She starts bringing rough things into the nest. <laughs> Sticks and sharp things, maybe some thorns. She starts bringing where it's not so comfortable to just stay in the nest but she doesn't do it until they're ready to fly. She's not going to get them. God's starting to bring some rough things into the nest. Part of the reason he's teaching this is to start getting you to understand. It's time to fly. We're coming into revival. You've got more in you and on you than you realize you have. You have the authority of the believer. And honey, that is enough. Say it with me. I am a wrecking ball, a wrecking ball. For, the for the kingdom of darkness. Everywhere I go. Everywhere I, go. I, am I am anointed with the same Holy Ghost. As Jesus himself. As Jesus himself. And, I'm and I'm going forward in his name. To do good. To do good. And, heal and heal all that are oppressed of the devil. For God the Holy Ghost is with me. Hallelujah. Now listen to this. The king has decreed. That, now you don't have to repeat now. <laughs> the king has decreed. This law will, my words will never pass away, he says. What he said to that centurion, he's saying to us all. As you have believed, be it done unto you.